comments are right there, but anyway. Okay. Hey friends, we're back. Guess what? Dr. Nally is in the house. Um, sorry about earlier. Sorry about the whole seven o'clock thing. Um, Dr. Nally and I attended KetoCon this weekend. It was exciting, amazing, and exhausting all at the same time. And um, luckily he came on very last minute. Dr. Boz uh, will probably be back next week. And uh, Dr. Nally, the reason why I asked him to come on, first of all, he's amazing. Um, but okay. second of all, I saw his YouTube channel at YouTube forward slash Dr. Nally. He has an amazing video on, in fact, I think it's your, one of your, it's a top video for you on insulin resistance. Yeah. And this is the topic we wanted to talk about this last week. And we, of course, as Dr. Boz and I kind of run out of, <laughs> we talk and talk, we ran out of time and didn't get to insulin resistance and it was on the list. So you are a pro. Um, I've told everybody already that you're the, you're a board certified family physician and you're an obesity medicine specialist and you've been running a clinic for 15 years, I believe. 20 years actually. Oh, yeah. 20 years. Okay. So you definitely know what you're talking about. So <laughs> I welcome you to this channel, the keto friendly recipes page. We've got so many people that are saying hello. Hi, everybody. Hi, John. Hi, Kathy. Hi, Christy. Thanks for tuning back in. Hey, Joe. Glad you could catch us. Um, so let's talk insulin resistance. The why, the how, the what, the what the heck. <laughs> <laughs> That's, let's do. Let's do. Do, <laughs> do you want to start with a question or what do you want to, how do you want to start it? Well, you know what? Can you tell us? I think there's a lot of people on here that really don't even know. Like, what the heck is it? Like, we hear insulin resistance. I, we don't, I think, even understand what it is. So maybe give us a basis of it. And then, you know, we want to know how to fix it. We want to know why we have it. We want to know what are the signs of it. Like, just whatever you can tell us about this crazy thing that we supposedly have. <laughs> so the, the first section of my book is essentially about insulin resistance. And it's because what I started seeing in the first five years of my practice was this pattern. Um, this pattern of people showing up with skin tags and thickening around the neck and um, weight gain that wouldn't respond to caloric restriction and exercise. Um, I had the same problem. My father had it. Um, there's a whole slew of it reasons that it's th there. I, I, it's not really a disease. I think it's a response to our, mm -hmm. uh, to our diet and our environment uh, in a number of capacities, but, but specifically uh, it's a response to our body's uh, intake of, of starches and carbohydrates and sugar. Um, some, some doctors blame it all on fructose. Others blame it on simple table sugar. Um, in the 20 years that I've been in practice, I, I see it. Uh, once you have this response that is abnormal, you, you respond this way to all starches and all carbohydrates. And so the, the approach to treating it is really trying to um, uh, reverse that. And so to make it simple, um, 20 years before you ever become a type 2 diabetic, um, your body begins to overproduce insulin. And I, I say it this way, if I were to give, well, if you were to give me, a, I'm insulin resistant. My father weighed 400 pounds before he passed away at 58 from all the complications of diabetes. And, um, and his labs and my labs looked identical in our early 30s. Uh, if you give me a piece of bread or anyone a piece of bread, you should theoretically produce a slice worth of insulin from the pancreas to use and, and um, absorb the glucose the, and the fructose that's in that bread and or the sugars essentially but if you give that piece of bread to me i literally produce 10 times the insulin response to that bread um, now wow. insulin stays active for 12 hours so if i eat a piece of bread for breakfast i produce 10 times the insulin response for the next 12 hours and let's say i have a piece of bread for dinner i'm literally producing 10 times the insulin 24 hours a day seven days a week now insulin is the most powerful hormone in stimulating inflammation. It's the most powerful hormone in stimulate, stimulating um, uh, changes in cholesterol. It's the most powerful hormone in stimulating your blood pressure. And it literally drives um, the weight gain. It, it, it literally pushes um, the triglyceride and cholesterol into the fat cell. Without insulin, you will not gain fat. If you take away the insulin from a type one diabetic, they are skinny as a rail. They, they cannot gain weight. And insulin is the only hormone that allows you to gain weight. So if you're gaining weight, you're overproducing insulin, period, end of story. And that's what I see literally with 85% of the people in my practice and I have for years and years. And so I started studying very heavily, what is this insulin resistance thing? And 
a guy named Joseph Kraft did 13,000 five hour glucose and insulin tests uh, a while, a number of years ago. Um, this is so, and I started, and when I read his hard? work. Is that that orange drink of sugary? Oh, stuff? it's like, so, so just like when you have that, uh, that drink they give you when you're pregnant and that two hour glucose tolerance test that every woman I've ever talked to hates, can't stand it. It made them sick I, to their stomach. I passed out. Yeah. Cause they, people get hypoglycemic from it. Well, yeah. he did that to people. He actually gave them five grams more than they normally do. And then he tested not for just two hours, but he tested glucose and insulin for five hours thereafter. And he recorded it. And he saw what I've been seeing for years and years and years is that not only does the glucose spike and then bottom out, and many people will get hypoglycemic, but the insulin level spikes up to 40 times higher than normal in some people, wow. 40 times. So that's why some of us that walk by a bakery, we just walk by, we gain weight. And that's yes. the- is that that's true? The, like you smell the bread? You you're smell like, the bread and there's an insulin response. Yes. Literally. Yes. Oh. And so there are people that have that challenge. I was one of them. My father was one of them. All of the Nally men, most of us, um, are, have this tremendous insulin resistance. Now, I suspect this is a, a genetic um, uh, protection because my family all comes from up in the Scandinavian countries where there was snow all the time yes. and we rarely saw carbs. And then all of a sudden you introduce us to carbohydrates and we go, woohoo, and we store, we store fat for the next 30, 365 days a year. And I, so I, I, it's not really a, a disease as much as it is a syndrome of inappropriate insulin response to a diet that literally is 85% sugar, 365 days a year. Wow, that's crazy. Um, so that's, Christy said, nutshell. that's real, I knew it. <laughs> <laughs> it is real, Christy, it's absolutely real, uh, totally real. Wow. Hey, we have we have a couple questions here. If you're ready, unless you want, I am, I am ready. Okay, so Kenny and Taff, uh, Tammy Bow says, "I was told I have insulin resistance, and I am not a diabetic. I, um, labs are perfect. A1C is 4.1. Cholesterol great. No response to keto diet or 96 hours of fasting. Any advice?" So. He's probably going to give very general advice because we're not allowed to give doctor patient advice on this channel. But what would somebody do if they're really struggling? They've done the keto diet and um, she's not diabetic and her A1C is great. So remember, and, and this is the whole premise. And if you if you I, I think on one of the videos we talked about insulin resistance, I actually show you the graph. Insulin resistance is there 20 years before you're ever you ever qualify for a type two diabetic. Um, that, in, that, in, that insulin level increases and increases and increases over time. So you may very well have normal, normal hemoglobin, normal hemoglobin C, the HbA1c number. You may have a normal fasting blood sugar, but you're going to be gaining weight. And that's, that's, and that's classic. If I were to do a two or three hour insulin response test to you, your fasting insulin level should be less than five. Now, the lab says fasting insulin should be under 20. That's wrong. It should be under five. Um, your two hour recovery of insulin should actually drop to 40 within two hours. Most people are still at hundred at two hours. Oh. And so, so to be, to be frank, the real true way to test, are you full, really insulin resistant is to check your insulin at a fast and check your insulin two hours after a meal. But most people don't want to do that because it's a horrible test and it's expensive. And most insurance, most docs don't want to do it. And, and the, every time I sent patients for that, the lab would say that doctor now is crazy. Um, but, <laughs> it, but the other way to do it is if you have skin tags, I yes. guarantee you're, you have insulin resistance. If you have those little polyps of skin anywhere on your neck, arms, that is, that's pathognomonic, meaning it, it, meaning it, it, it is the true one sign of insulin resistance. You know, um, I had some, and I think two years into my journey, they started to fall off or lessen mm -hmm. or lighten. Um, does it take that long to correct? Because so Catherine's takes... asking, does it, she said it can take 20, 12 to 24 months to correct insulin resistance. Is that correct, Dr. Nally? That is talking. correct. That is, that is what I see clinically. It takes 18 to 24 months for people's insulin resistance to begin to improve. Um, that was one of the things that I've seen over and over for the last 15 years of doing this with myself and with my patients is that it literally, and the reason is this, it's not a broken pancreas, it's a broken fat cell. Uh, when the fat cells get bigger and bigger and bigger, the fat cells produce 178 known hormones, 177 of which are all inflammatory. Um, eight of those hormones are what drive the liver to keep the, the blood sugar slightly elevated. And two of them damper down the effect of insulin on the liver. So what's happening is you have fat cells that are overproducing hormones that are making the excess insulin 
not work. So the, it, so the pancreas produces more. And it takes about two years for the fat cells to shrink down and, and correct this abnormal hormone balance that's occurring. Wow. So basically, you know you have it if you're overweight, you have skin tags, the darkness on the back of your neck. Um, any other signs? So if you so if you have a, if you're a female and your waist circumference is greater than a, a 35 inch around your waist, and that's measured right at the top of the hip bones, uh, just underneath the belly button. That's the measurement. Um, and, uh, if it's greater than 35 as a female, you're you 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 more than likely you have insulin resistance. If you're a male and it's 40 inches. Um, you, you probably have it. Most men will never come near a measuring tape. So I just tell the guys, close your eyes and walk toward the wall. And if the first thing that touches the wall is your stomach, you have insulin resistance. So that's, that's how guys figure it out. Um, and then, uh, skin tags, it, the acanthosis, nigricans, which is that darkening skin around the neck. Um, other classic signs, uh, would be if you have carb cravings every two hours, more than likely. And if your triglycerides are over 150, um, I, almost 95% of those people have insulin resistance. So how do you fix it then? Is it just, I mean, I know you and I are very big promoters of the keto diet, high fat. Um, so yeah, the, the, so the, the issue is there's no pill that fixes this. That's the problem. The only way to let, let this, to fix it is to get the fat cell to begin to shrink. And the only way to get the fat cell to begin to shrink is to stop pushing fat into the fat cell. Well, remember the one hormone that drives fat into the fat cell is insulin. Insulin also, if insulin's on, it turns off the back door, so the fat cell closes, and it turns on the front door, and, and, fat, and fat enters. When insulin goes down, the front door closes, and the back door opens up, and fat exits, if that makes sense. <clears throat> it's one of five back doors to the fat cell that lets fat out, is what insulin is. So it has this push-pull effect on the, on the front back. Um, so we, we want to bring the insulin level down. So anything that's going to raise your insulin level is, is going to pr propagate this insulin resistance. Anything that brings the insulin level back to a baseline, we don't want to turn insulin off. Insulin is essential for both glucose metabolism and insulin actually is essential for ketone metabolism. Um, but, but we don't want, so we don't want to turn it off. We just want to bring it back to a baseline. And, yeah. and that takes literally restriction of starches and carbohydrates. So some people can see that with hundred grams of carbs or less, but for people like me, it has to, we have to drop it all the way down to less than 20 grams per day. So when you're talking about this insulin test and it's hard to go to the doctor and you have to go get it done, we most of this audience here has the glucose monitor along with the ketone. Is there a way we can be checking it with that? Um, <clears throat> you kind of have to extrapolate, and that's that's the challenge, and that's where uh, the glucose uh, ketone indexes come up. That's where all these different pieces have come up. Trying trying to find out is there a way to to, to bridge this without doing this you know this really expensive insulin test. Um, mm -hmm. And unfortunately, as of yet, there's not. But to, to diagnose insulin resistance, if, if you have at any time in your life had a fasting blood sugar higher than 99, and in my office higher than 95 is what I my cut off, uh, then you're, you have insulin resistance. If at any time you've had a, 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 any, any blood sugar randomly um, after two hours after a meal greater than 140, you have insulin resistance. So if you, so if you check your blood sugar and it's 142 and it was two hours since your last meal, you're insulin resistant. If you wake up first thing in the morning, you check your blood sugar and it's 101, you have insulin resistance. Okay. Well, that explains, I've been doing this a lot longer than my husband. He wakes up with higher blood sugars and I don't, I've been doing it so long. I never tested my blood in the morning. Um, I was hypoglycemic. I, I've done very well on the keto diet. And now when I test my numbers, I've got really good sugars, like in the seventies. And when I fast, yeah. I can get down I can get those ketones up and get those sugars down and be in a really good ratio. But my husband, he's like, I've been doing this. What's wrong? And you know, he's, he's under a year doing it. And he's like, why do I wake up with like 199, 101? Like this is not right. And he's still insulin resistant. I've been doing it. I've been doing this for 15 years. Um, and, and if I cheat, um, I will literally see morning sugars of 102, 107, still to this day. Um, I still have a, and it's related to a small amount of fat that I still retain around my belly and it's genetic and it's, it's slowly shrinking, but it's taking me time. And so, um, I had to, for the first, my practice is uh, a significant, well, my average patient age in my office is 65 or older. So I use, I have a very, very heavy geriatric population in my practice. I work out in the sun cities here in Arizona. And, uh, 
Uh, so a large percentage of my patients are, are over 65, they're Medicare age. Um, and one of the challenges that I, I found was that a lot of them couldn't exercise. So I don't usually do anything unless I experiment on myself first with my prep patients. And so with this, because there was not a lot of data about it, I started doing it. So I stopped exercising. And I, and other than throwing hay out to my horses every weekend, um, I, 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 I used to run triathlons and all sorts of stuff like that. Um, I stopped doing that for about 10 years and I just followed a diet and I lost 65 pounds and I maintained it, but that little last bit of fat around my belly, I could not get rid of until I started reinstituting uh, exercise, specifically resistance exercise and running. And so in the last year, um, I've dropped another 15 pounds and it's still coming off little by little, but that insulin resistance still hangs on. And it does so because of one, one genetics and two various sweeteners with, and things like that, that, that play a role there too. But there's a whole slew of reasons that way, which is probably a whole other podcast in of itself. Yeah. But those so, are, go ahead. We, well, we talked about the higher uh, blood sugars in the morning, but what about that dawn phenomenon? Because that's what everybody's saying that, you know, when you start waking up and the cortisol and, and how does that play a role? Or how so, you it, so if you're insulin resistant um, and what, what, what happens is, uh, especially this happens especially with diabetics but even those that are insulin resistant will see this happen if you eat a meal that's higher in starch or sugar the night before what happens is your body overproduces insulin but remember that it, and that insulin lasts for about 12 hours in your system it's most active in the first two to four hours but it's still present for 12 hours so if i for dinner my if my dinner was four krispy creams a ding dong and a twinkie then what would happen was my blood sugar would spike quite high and i would feel fine i would go to bed and that blood sugar would go way up. My pancreas would go, holy cow, and it would shoot a bunch of insulin out. And then by about three o'clock in the morning, my blood sugar would bottom out and I'd get hypoglycemic. Now, I might wake up. I might not, depending on how low it goes. But then the liver goes, whoa, and the liver then dumps out a bunch of glucose into your bloodstream. And so within about a three to four hour window, all of a sudden your blood sugar jumps up to 110, 120. And it's called the Dawn phenomenon. And, it, and it's a response to and a spike in insulin. Now you can get that from a meal. You can also get that if you're type one diabetic and you overshoot your insulin. Um, that, that's another way it can happen. So that's that's what the dawn phenomenon is. Wow. If you guys are finding this insulin resistant talk um, helpful, if you can share this out, um, I feel like this is such good information that not many people are talking about and hit the share button. I also wanna mention that, uh, I know I said it earlier, but we have so many more people that have jumped on since we started. Um, you can find Dr. Nally at docmuscles.com. You can find him on YouTube forward slash um, Dr. Nally. You can also, oh, can you tell him your Instagram? Instagram is at docmuscle. If you type in docmuscles on Google, it'll pop up all my, a bunch of stuff too. It's just D-O-C-M-U-S-L-E-S, docmuscles. Yeah. Um, so, so we have a lot of people asking about um, menopause and insulin resistance, which I think, you know, they're kind of at my level, like totally deep in menopause and uh, <laughs> um, So the really cool thing that I find, well, it's not cool because it causes more problems and people think they're, they're, they're dying from it. Um, I'll start someone on a ketogenic diet and they're in their per per perimenopause or menopausal range. And one of the things we have to remember is that um, estrogen and progesterone and testosterone are all bound to fat. Um, that's how they, that's how they function, especially estrogen. And so if you carry extra weight, um, yeah. what happens is that that estrogen gets, gets stored into the fat cell with your, with your fat molecules. And as you start mobilizing more fat and that fat's released out of the fat cell, all of a sudden your estrogen level goes up. Well, if you're a female and you know what happens when progesterone goes down and estrogen goes up, you have a cycle or you have hot flashes or you have a period. Um, those those excite and, and they flux and they'll do that for two or three months with a lot of patients. So I'll have patients that'll have great fat loss and then they cheat and they go off for a while. And then all of a sudden they start having great fat loss again. And they said, I thought I was past this hot flash issue. Well, what's happening is you're now mobilizing estrogen and hot flashes occur or the menopause symptoms occur when estrogen goes up or estrogen goes down. When estrogen is stable, it, it doesn't flood. You don't, you don't feel those symptoms when progesterone and estrogen are balanced. You're less likely to have the hot flashes that occur, but it's the flux of estrogen up or down that drives the hot flash. And so initially I tell women, don't be surprised. You're going to have hot flashes. You're going to feel weird for the first month or two. That's normal, but it should level off as long as your fat loss is staying consistent. But if you're cheating, if you're having, you know, if you're, if you're doing things that are um, sabotaging that progress, you may see that fluctuate. If you don't see it resolve within two or three months, then we want to truly look at your female hormones or your male hormones, if you're male, 
and say, where, where, what's, where are they at? Do we need to fix it? Um, a predominant number of my patients are estrogen dominant, meaning because of a whole number of reasons, they're, it's not the estrogen level or the progesterone level per se, it's the ratio of the two together that really makes people feel good or bad. And it, what happens is a large percentage of things that we eat, a large percentage of our cosmetics actually stimulate estrogen-like responses. And so uh, we have a lot of women that are, that are symptomatic estrogen dominant. Now, even though progesterone, when you were pregnant, caused you to restore extra fat, too much estrogen will also cause you to store fat, especially around your hips. And so if you have that, that pear shape, guess what? Your estrogen dominant. That's yeah. totally me. Oh my <laughs> God. You know, it's funny because I did really well for, on keto for two years. I lost weight, had some hot plastic when I first started. And that was the movement of exactly what you're saying, the estrogen and the fat cells. And then it happened again. And I had stayed really, really strict, like really strict for two years. So all when that was happening, I was very, very strict. But I noticed that when I really started fasting or pushing or stressing my body to lose more, um, that's when the hot flashes would go up. And then they just, they were hard and heavy and it was horrible. So, <laughs> so you're mobilizing fat and releasing more estrogen is what yeah. happens with that frequently. Yeah. Um, and then the second issue is if you're on a synthetic form of, of um, estrogen and, and or progesterone, the synthetic form of progesterone will not cross the blood brain barrier. And so it works from the bottom half of your body down, but it doesn't work from the top half. And the challenge is that part of that modulation of the ratio, if progesterone can't cross the blood brain barrier and estrogen can't do so effectively, then you'll also have hot flashes. And so one of the reasons I'm a big proponent of bioidentical hormones is, is because we want that progesterone to be able to cross that blood brain barrier and all of the synthetics don't. That's the pro that's one of the big challenges with the synthetics. And that's why I, I, in medical school, all of us were taught, you know, use, use Premarin and use, you know, these forms of estrogen, but they're all synthetic. Mm -hmm. And that, that um, caused a whole slew of other problems that a lot of women s s have suffered with as well. So, so if you're not seeing success with where you're at with your hormones, you need to have your doctor check, you may consider, you know, using the bioidenticals because that that's for my patients, that's been a huge change for them. Wow. Well, I know that the scale has stagnated, which is fine. I'm, I haven't gained, which is great. Um, the hot flashes are gone. Thank God. But I've, I've wondered, I'm not on synthetic. I mean, I am on synthetic and I really, I've been told you really need to look at this. And now I'm kind of scared to change for fear of messing up. Well, and, and, you, and if you change, you want to do so really slowly. The challenge that I have with most patients is that they want to just fix it overnight. And it takes literally 60 days to balance progesterone. It takes 90 days to balance estrogen. So you're, you're looking at three to six month processes of, of fluctuation. And it's a slow process. And you just have to be prepared for that and say, okay, I'm ready to do it. But yeah. remember, estrogen and testosterone are two of the back doors of the fat cell to let fat out. And if your estrogen levels are too high and testosterone is too low, you will not see that weight move. And, and that's one of the reasons for plateau frequently for a lot of the, my patients. Yeah. So we've got a lot of questions. So Cynthia Armstrong says this explains so much. It does, doesn't it? <laughs> like it just, I love the way you explain it. So it's so easy to understand. Um, let me kind of look at the um, comments. Teresa says, um, I have a lot of skin tags, been keto for six months, only lost 19 pounds. What do you mean only? only. That's, wonderful. <laughs> that's wonderful. And my hormones are out of whack. Girl, that's exactly, he just explained why that makes so, sense. So let me interject something for your, for your wonderful audience. Um, yeah. And I have to explain this over and over um, to patients. I have to remind myself of it. Um, the scale uh, lies. Um, I, I, I tell people, take the scale and give it to the neighbor you don't like. All I want you to do is follow your waist circumference. That's what I want you to do. Um, if, if your waist is shrinking, you're seeing success. And, there, and this is, seems to be more predominant with women than it is with men. Um, because number one, men rarely get on a scale. And number two, um, they see their waist move fairly quickly because they have testosterone. Um, women have a lower level of testosterone, so it doesn't move as fast. But if I take a cup of muscle and a cup of fat, that cup of muscle, the volume of muscle, literally weighs twice as much as fat. And many women who have excess body fat mm -hmm. cannot make muscle. And as soon as you now allow the body to start making muscle, even without exercise, you're, if I give you the right diet, your body will say, I got to put more muscle on and it will do so. And the, the scale weight may not move, but your waist will shrink. So what, I mean, the mantra in my office is stop, stop getting on the scale, let your doctor measure you once a month. 
-hmm. and bacon makes your pants fall off. And that's the rule of thumb. And then so if, if you're seeing your waist shrink, you know you're seeing success. So don't worry about the scale. Good. Mary says, can this, you know, that darkening of the skin, can that happen on your knees and your elbows too? Absolutely. Around the neck, under the arms and the elbows and the knees, uh, behind the knees, even on the tops of the feet. I've seen it behind the ears in some people. Wow. Somebody says they're going to have to re, oh, Christy says, I'm going to have to rewatch this for sure. Definitely. <laughs> right? Dr. Nally talks really fast. So I'm going to watch it. Really fast. Yeah. yeah. I, I get excited and, and I talk really fast. So if you need me to slow down or re repeat, please tell me. Cause I, I get so excited about this stuff. My wife says, slow down, Adam. Stop it. Yeah. Well, I tell you what I'll do. I will have this transcribed and I will put it in a blog post because this is so important. People really want to hear it. They want to know what's going on. They want to know why, how, what, and how can we fix it? Exactly. Uh, yeah. Let me let me go back. Thank you guys for sharing that. There's a lot of people that said they shared. So thank you so thank much. You. For that. We're, we are definitely here. We do this to help people and that will help. If you can share it, that helps people. Okay, so Christy says, so it's like type type two diabetes. Once you have it, you have it. It can be helped, but it doesn't go away if you if you stop taking care of it. I would say, yeah, that's correct. It, it takes and it takes time. Remember, it, it's you didn't get here overnight, and you won't get there overnight either. So it, it takes you know it takes time, years. We're talking, but yeah. it, it's it's a slow process, little by little. And I just have to keep reminding patients. I have to remind myself as well. This is a slow process, and. Yeah. What's really cool is that metabolically, you're going to be metabolically healthy before you see the weight come off completely. And that's that's the most healthy way to be. You're, so you're, how do you know you're metabolically healthy? So, for instance, you know, when I for, in, in my in my 30s, when I was in medical school and eating really healthy hospital food you know, in residency, um, my triglycerides were over 400. Um, my my A1C was at 5.6, which is a, literally almost diabetic. I was 65 pounds heavier than I am today. Um, <clears throat> my blood pressure was in the 160s and 70s. In fact, every time they took my blood pressure, they wanted to send me to the ER, and I was an ER resident. Um, and so it was my I, I was a walking time bomb, and I felt great, but I was a walking time bomb, just like my father. You know, my father ended up. He literally weighed 400 pounds at 42. He had his he had a quintuple bypass, which is five blood vessels. Three three years later, two three of those had to get stented. Actually, four, five years later. Um, then he went into renal failure. He was on dialysis. He had what's called charcoal joints of the feet, which means the heels collapsed and he couldn't walk. Um, and just every every complication of diabetes, he had it. Uh, and my labs and his labs look identical. Today, I've been doing this now for 15 years. I've been living this lifestyle for 15 years. My A1C is now 4.9 to 5.0. My triglycerides dropped from over 450 down to the last check was 51. Wow. Um, my blood pressure is always under 110 now. Um, I've, I've literally maintained my weight where I'm at right now, um, well, 15 pounds a little lighter, um, for over 10 to 12 years with, with very minimal exercise. Just um, And my job is high stress. I mean, I work 12 to 18 hours a day in the office. And I'm home charting, and so it's it's you know being a physician is high stress, and I've been able to maintain weight with that that with wow. that high cortisol that's always there. So yeah. so, all, and all of my patients the same way. We see that same um, profile change literally within a couple months. Now, wow. but the and the weight comes down afterwards. But you have to get in. You have to be metabolically healthy before you start seeing that weight come off. So if you guys want to see a picture of him. I took a I took a picture with him at KetoCon, and you can find it on the Instagram page for Keto Friendly Recipes. Um, <laughs> go over and check it out. He uh, it's it's you can see exactly what he looks like. He's a he's a big bulky guy, and I look like a little person. Next to him. <laughs> hey, Kathy's asking, what are your thoughts on artificial sweeteners? So, so I have lots of thoughts on artificial sweeteners, Kathy. In fact, I wrote a whole chapter in the book. So if, if you want to, and actually you can actually get that, that chapter is on my website at docmuscles.com. Go to the menu and click on freebies and it'll talk about the skinny on sweeteners and the entire chapter is right there. Um, okay. Sweeteners have been the bane of my existence. Um, uh, there are only four sweeteners that I'm comfortable with that don't raise insulin. Uh, one of those still stimulates insulin resistance in the gut bacteria and so it can be a problem so you have to be careful with it but i've written about written out all of them um okay. i'm okay with erythritol i'm okay with liquid stevia and i'm okay with chicory root um I, in my practice i've used aspartame 
be, uh, because as obesity docs, we were taught to use that because it suppresses the appetite and it doesn't stimulate the insulin response. But aspartame does bother the gut bacteria and, and can propagate insulin resistance in the gut. So, we, so um, I will often bridge people with the use of aspartame and then try to get them off later. But those are the, so those are the only three that I ever recommend. Um, any of the other sugar alcohols you want to avoid, like the plague, uh, especially a sulfame potassium, which is the most commonly used um, sweetener currently uh, in most of the, the diet or low carb foods. You have to be very careful with that. Which uh, one is that? Like a brand? It's called a sulfame potassium. It's not, it's not sold in the, uh, to, to use to cook. So you can't cook with it, but it's in okay. most soft drinks or most low carb drinks or most low carb uh, bars and shakes. Uh, and then the one that, you're, that I see a ton of use now with a lot of low carb products and the low carb people are going to hate me for this um, mm -hmm. is monk fruit. About 50% of my patients will actually spike insulin. I'm one of them. It will spike insulin with the use of monk fruit. Monk fruit you know is what? a fructose. I've read that. I've read that there are some people that are highly sensitive to monk fruit. and some I'm one of them, yeah. Yeah, and some people it doesn't. I love monk fruit, and I've tested my glucose. It has not done anything to me. And it I'm a big no, fan. Well, remember... 100% of fructose is metabolized in the liver and, and fructose and alcohol are metabolized identically. So what happens is it, it enters the liver, it's changed into an aldehyde. That aldehyde then produces an insulin response five hours later. So you won't see the insulin rise from fructose or monk fruit for up to, or alcohol for five hours. Okay. Um, it will stimulate, for me, it stimulates cravings two hours later because the aldehyde stimulates the same aldehyde that morphine does in the brain and goes, oh, that was really good. And two hours <laughs> later, you want another donut. And so that's the challenge. And you said liquid. I heard you say specifically liquid, liquid stevia. stevia. Mm -hmm. Yeah. See, to, stevia, I actually grew, grew, grow stevia in my garden and stevia is a plant. And to get the stevia out of it, you actually have to press the leaf and it's a liquid. Yeah. Um, to make it a crystal, they bind it to something called dextrose or maltodextrin. And those are just two forms of sugar that work for the FBI or the CIA. And so you, you want to be cautious because when stevia is in a crystalline form, um, it, it's usually bound to a form of a sugar. And that, that it's the form of that sugar that's the problem, not the stevia itself. Wow. Okay. Catherine wants to know, do you manage any patients via telemedicine? I do what's called, um, I have a concierge service, and but, but the challenge because of Arizona medical law is I have to actually physically see you face-to-face -face at least once in my, in my office in Arizona. Um, it, once I've established a, a relationship with you in Arizona, face to face in my office, then I can treat you um, via telemedicine in various places. Um, some states have various laws, and so we have to be cautious with those. But, but for the most part, I can treat you because I've, we've established care face to face. Um, the challenge is that uh, I, 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 I'm, I'm looking into doing some specifically um, nutritional counseling. But I've had, my medical law basically says that still falls under the practice of medicine. So I have to be real careful with that. So I have patients that do kind of the direct primary care in Arizona. I have, I have patients that come to see me from all around the world, but, but they have to see me at least once a, once a year in my office face to face. And then yeah. I can do telemedicine outside of that. Okay. So Kathy Parsons Crawford is saying, you have to come back again. She is loving this. Well, guess what, Kathy? Doc Muscles and I, do you mind if I call you Doc Muscles? That's fine. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, Adam, Adam, Dr. Nelly, hey, you, I respond to all that. Yeah. Well, we've talked, uh, we've talked to KetoCon. We talked before this. Um, we are definitely going to do something again and again and again. Um, cause this is too much fun. It's a lot of information. It's really good information that I think people need. And you know what? There's a lot of people. Um, I think the guys would probably want us to talk about testosterone because I'm certain that the same thing that you're talking about with the cells and everything has to affect the guys testosterone too, right? Oh, absolutely. I actually did a, it might be on, I actually did an, uh, a presentation at the metabolic health summit in, uh, um, Los Angeles in January on testosterone. And wow. um, so testosterone is one of my, one of my favorite uh, things to talk about. 60% of the men that come to me in my office that are insulin resistant have low testosterone and, and, and it, it drives a whole problem, a whole slew of men's issues. And yeah. so, yes, that's, that's, that's a huge topic. Um, that, my uh, husband would want to talk to you for sure. He, oh, yeah, he, it's, gets, he gets shots and he's been doing the diet. He's down 85 pounds. Oh, that's like, awesome. Oh, amazing. But he's still, he, he's always carried his weight in his stomach and he's given up beer, which that is a miracle in itself. I didn't think he would ever do it, but he did. He's like a total rock star. 
but I think we definitely that testosterone is probably a whole nother talk, isn't it? Oh, we could talk for I we could talk for two hours about testosterone, but it's okay. a. Okay. I, I've actually done so. If people want to know right away if they go to my YouTube channel, uh, yeah. it's uh, they can actually see I've done two different uh, a short and a longer presentation on testosterone for my YouTube patient or for my YouTube channel. Okay, so there's good. some stuff there already, but but I'd say that would it would be a great thing to talk about. Good for, for, your, for your audience. When I write out this blog post, I will link that testosterone um, video in the blog post also so people can find it. So Gail wants to know, do most of your patients fast also? Are you big into fasting? So uh, the the literature right now, um, well, let me let me back up and quantify it. The uh, ketogenic diet, if it's done correctly, stimulates natural periods of fasting. So uh, I normally don't eat breakfast because if I eat a, if I eat a good meal at dinner, I'm usually not hungry till 12 or one o'clock. And so I don't normally eat a, a, a meal in the morning. Um, and my first meal is at lunch and then I'll have a dinner. And so usually I do two meals a day. Now, when I first started doing this, because I was so insulin resistant, I was ravenous. And so I, I literally ate a pound of sausage and three eggs cooked in butter every morning for almost two or three months. And I had, a, then I would have a double pat, double burger wrapped in lettuce at lunch. And then I have a big piece of meat with a salad at dinner. And I did that for a few months. And then all of a sudden, as I became less and less insulin resistant, all of a sudden my appetite suddenly went, you're full. And I realized I could back that way down. I was eating about 5,000 calories a day for the first few months that I did this. And I still lost 65 pounds. But that plateaus once you keto adapt around two or three months. And that's where a lot of people plateau because they still keep thinking they need to eat that much. And they don't. And so if you're listening to your body's hormones, which is the other piece that we talk about a lot, is I want you to start listening. When you're, when you're full, stop eating. Don't eat. And are you eating because you're truly hungry? Are you eating because you're bored? Are you eating because you're stressed? So I'd say check those uh, reasons, and that's usually why I uh, – but so, so to go on to the fasting question, I, I'm a big fan of intermittent fasting when, when you're listening to your body that way. Now, there's argument back and forth right now with a lot of the fasting people. My big concern is that when I see people fast – frequently for longer than three days, it dramatically suppresses testosterone, uh, testosterone it, by up to 50%, and it dramatically lowers the thyroid function permanently. And so I'm not a big fan of the long, prolonged fast longer than three days. Being, uh, once in a while, if you did it, it's not a big deal. But if you're doing it routinely, which I hear a lot of people doing, um, you can, at least according to the literature I've read in the most, two, two most recent studies, permanently suppress that thyroid function. And that's a big factor for a lot of my patients because they're already behind the eight ball when it comes to the conversion of T4 to T3. Wow. For those of you asking about the Keto Cure book, I went ahead and linked it in the comments. I will also, in the blog post, I will also put the link to the book. Um, I just ordered it myself. I can't wait to read it. Um, and I know Jimmy Moore as well. I'm a big fan of Jimmy. He's a wonderful guy. Well, good. Um, wow, this is amazing, amazing information. I think we covered most of it though. Do you have anything else on insulin resistance that you had wanted to add or talk about? Well, I saw somebody ask a question about they had lost weight, but they still hadn't lost weight around the chest or the breasts. Um, okay. Unfortunately, the breasts are the last to go, um, the abdomen and the breast. And the reason is that your body thinks um, even into your 50s and 60s that you may still want to have children and breastfeed. And so it will preserve that fatty tissue until very last. And then for a lot of people, that will be the last thing to go. Um, interesting. That's very interesting. Okay. Good to know. Good to know. Let's see here. Do we have anything else? Oh, Jamie says, I just read the Keto Cure last month. Awesome content. Don't oh, thank you, Jamie. to get it. That is awesome. Look, I'm going to put it up there. Look, thanks for that, Jamie. I'm... Oh yeah, and Selma says, excellent talk, thank you. You're very welcome. You're welcome. Um, if you guys want us, um, we're gonna try and brainstorm some topics and I'm really, really, really focusing on what is much needed and not um, given in the community. And I know that insulin resistance was a big topic. So if you guys have other talk topics that you want us to discuss or maybe schedule some future shows with Dr. Nally, Put them in the comments if you don't mind, and we can definitely go back and look at that, and we can schedule. We're kind of hoping to do something weekly. Um, I will still, Dr. Boz is definitely still going to be on. We love her. Um, we're trying to bring more experts onto the channel just to help everybody else who needs it. 
So um, thanks for tuning in, everybody. And I'm not sure when our schedules will connect, Dr. Nally, but we'll figure something out and we'll announce it soon. Absolutely. All right. Have a good evening, everybody. Have a good night. Good night. <laughs>